All right, so let's get started. Um, so uh, updates. So this week we have no formal lab. So the next uh, uh, lab that's assigned will be next week, lab nine and lab 10 the week after that. Um, some good stuff in these. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about output analyzer stuff as we move forward in a couple of lectures. Um, so basically a way to start applying these statistical methods to the outputs of your sims as opposed to the inputs. Um, and then uh, in the advanced topics, you might want to flip ahead to that because there are some cool constructs that will help you in building your models in your final project, like signals and holds and things like that. Um, but the, uh, the big thing in the short term is this input modeling report. I've tried to um, revise some of the stuff online to make clarifications, not looking for a lot of data or anything like that. Really, we're looking for one to two pages where it's clear that you've picked a system, you understand that system, you uh, know what um, the kind of salient inputs, decision variables and outputs will be, and you've maybe gathered a little bit of data on one or two of those inputs to show me that from pr preliminary data, we were able to capture this data, look at the data, and it looks like it's this particular distribution. So you've demonstrated to me that you have access to the system, you can get some preliminary data from the system, and you'll be able to go through the input modeling process. So not expecting you to gather all of your data, you know, right now this is just meant to show um, really that you're ready to work with this system for the rest of the final project so that we can be hands off until the final presentations um, and then so after these two labs then we'll just have open weeks as well um, to give you time to focus on the final project instead of doing this extra lab work um, so uh, this is pretty much uh, just the same stuff that i um, just said um, just kind of written down here, um, just making sure that you chose a feasible direction. So uh, what will happen is you'll turn this in Sunday night, and then I will start reading through the whatever 12 or 13 of these things are. And if I see red flags, then I'll sort of say that, oh, maybe this is a good system, but maybe you could study a slightly different aspect of it. Or, um, or well, this is actually a, uh, you know, a great question for like a master's thesis, but it's way too ambitious. So maybe we can actually make this simpler. Um, so those are kind of the two big things that I'm looking for there, as well as making sure that you've kind of filled out the, you know, actually taken some data and, and practiced. So there's a syllabus online. And again, I've, um, there's a document that describes the input modeling report, gives some examples from previous semesters for other students. Um, they're all on Canvas. And it's a group submission. So only one person needs to submit it in your group. Just make sure that on a title page for that thing, you've got all the group members there. So that kind of um, gives me confirmation that everybody has been working together to some extent uh, to the point where everyone's comfortable putting their names on that title page. Uh, otherwise, other assignments, the ICAs, uh, homework. Um, so um, uh, we've been talking about the uh, kind of chi-squared for the first question, power analysis for the second question. We demonstrated the power analysis in the unpaired example. Um, last time, and we will demonstrate the power analysis for the paired example in this time um, so that uh, you'll get um, a little bit more of that. Plus, there's videos on Canvas for extra help with this if you've not ever done a power analysis before. So any questions about the administrative stuff for the schedule moving forward? Also going to check chat here. Um, there's a question online. How much would you say is required for the project as a whole. The examples had about 300 to 500 data points. Is that enough? Um, that kind of is related to the power analysis question. If you just have to gather enough data to um, understand the variation in your system. If your system has a whole lot of variation, um, then you'll probably have to gather more data to model it appropriately. But um, if your system is not very variable, you won't have to gather that much. So um, if um, if you're looking at, um, you know, if you can imagine in, an, uh, in a manufacturing system, different aspects of the manufacturing system are going to have um, different amounts of quality control, which will reduce variation. You know, this whole Six Sigma crap is all about reducing variation. And so if you've got something that you've had no um, smart engineering um, applied to, there might be a huge amount of variation. And so to get the distribution of, you know, widget shapes and sizes and times of arrivals, you probably need to sample from a lot of different widgets. But if you're downstream and a part that's been a little bit more overly engineered and you're trying to understand the variation there, there's still going to be some variation because that's just life. 
But if it's been highly controlled variation, then you know that you know this part is pretty much always going to arrive 10 seconds after the last part. Sometimes it's 10 and a half, sometimes it's nine and a half, but uh, you know, there's never going to be a 12 or a 15. So once I get a, a, enough of those, then I pretty much know, you know, what the little bit of variation is around that. So um, it's really, it's, it's, I can't tell you ahead of time for sure that, you know, exactly you're going to need to take five samples or 500 samples, but in the systems, you should use the kind of lessons that we're learning now about statistical power to inform you as to, um, whether I need more or less. And as we start getting into interval estimation, which I think is next week, then we, that will become much clearer because when you start estimating parameters, you'll be estimating with an interval and you'll be able to know with the current data that I've sampled, I really only can know this parameter within this range. And this range is gigantic. So if I wanna really tell the difference between this range and this other range over here, these two ranges still overlap. So I need to take data until these ranges on this confidence interval are narrow enough to discriminate it from another confidence interval. So that'll be something we talk a lot about as we move on to interval estimation. So you don't have to do these formal power analyses. So interval estimation is kind of the simpler way to get at the same things that power analyses get to. So it'll become more clear as we move on. But um, for the input modeling report, um, this is really a preliminary data. So it's almost you can view it as um, I took enough data to get an idea what the variance is of my system based on the variance that I can estimate from the data I took, I'm gonna have to end up taking a lot more data to really trust my estimates. So I'm not expecting to go out and do a massive um, you know, uh, data gathering effort for this little report. It's more of um, you, know, you, you go out there and you try your data collection methods out and you demonstrate to me that in principle, given enough time, or enough manpower or human power, then you would be able to gather enough data. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, another question online, how many uh, points are knocked off by turned in by the 8th of November, which is the last day um, it's available, the 8th of November? Um, I, well, it shouldn't be, I'll have to double check, but I mean, so it's due, um, if it's been made available um, for later than that, it, then that, must have been a mistake and I'll go back and canvas. I have to take a look at that assignment anyway. So it is, the due date is what you should go by. And the normal availability grace period that I apply is 10 a.m. the next day. So when things are due on a Sunday, I usually make them available Monday at 8 a.m. If it's not Monday, then that was just a mistake when I translated dates from the last semester to this semester and I'll go ahead and fix that. So you gotta trust the due date on that. Um, and the availability will be 10 a.m. the next day. And as long as you get it in before that, then that's fine. Any other questions? Here or over here? Okay. Um, all right, so this is my annual Halloween stats lecture. So, um, so that's why I'm wearing the funny getup here, um, where the motivation here for this getup is that if you hear that, you know, that spooky sound, you know, upstairs or outside or whatever, you either can assume it's the wind, and that's what we call a null hypothesis, or you could assume it's something else, um, a ghost, for example. And that's what we refer to as the alternative hypothesis. And so the real question is, how weird is the thing that you heard for you to declare that this is not the wind, this is not the null, and, um, and, and how do we set those thresholds? And so, you know, I think it says in the bottom of my jacket, um, we're uh, ready to believe you. Well, that means that they're ready to accept um, a, a greater false positive rate because they want to make sure that they catch all the true positives. So if there really is something crazy going on, then um, they want to be the ones who are there and they're willing to sometimes you know, be wrong about assuming it's something crazy, whereas everybody else uh, might have a different threshold where they would be much more willing to just say, um, it, it's probably nothing and they're not gonna believe you if you say, I think my house is haunted. So, um, so I think that uh, I like that this stat stuff happens to fall kind of right on this time of year because I think it provides a nice context to talk about these things. So that's kind of the running uh, examples that I'll kind of be going through here. So, um, so we've talked about this, uh, you know, this alpha, which again, this is all review stuff. So. Um, 
remember that our phrasing here is that the dominant phrasing we're going to use is that a positive result is a detection. So a positive result is detecting that or is detecting or, or concluding that it is a ghost. So that it's the normal result is that it's not. So a null hypothesis is just state of the art. So an alternative hypothesis, the thing that you're detecting, you know, when you reject the null, um, a detection of a deviation from the null, it means that there is something else going on other than normal. So null and normal are kind of two things you should kind of think uh, in your head. And so if um, the, the normal was true, then if we, our error rate alpha represents how often we reject it, how often we say that that result, that bump that I heard upstairs, that thing is, um, is definitely not normal. Well, how often do I say that incorrectly when that bump that I heard upstairs really was just the tree hitting the outside of the roof or something like that? So, uh, so that's, that's our error rate. It's our, our tendency to overestimate when something crazy is going on, where the crazy is the alternative hypothesis. And so our p-value is a way in which we operationalize that when we build hypothesis tests. And so this alpha has got, when you build any hypothesis test, it's got to live up to its advertised alpha. Well, how do you do that? Well, you build a hypothesis test where you calculate a p-value and that p-value is the probability of the observed deviation or a greater deviation if we assume the hypothesis is true. So we look at all of the sounds that could be made given that it's just the wind. And of all of those sounds that could be made, which we could model because we have a model of the wind, then um, we can say, um, how often does it get like a really loud thump followed by three small thumps or something like that? And you could say, well, that is a particular sound pattern that does happen, but doesn't happen that often. And there are weirder sound patterns that happen even less often. So we're gonna bundle all those things up together and the probability of that weird pattern or any weirder patterns, that's a p-value. And so that's something we can mathematically model. And we can then use alpha as our threshold for that p-value. And then we're guaranteed that uh, by the definition of how we've, we've built a p-value that we will meet our alpha criteria, that our hypothesis test will not have false positives for more than alpha. So that's how we design hypothesis tests. And so you can take an off the shelf hypothesis test, but something that we sometimes do with simulation is we have to build a hypothesis test out of our simulated results. So that, um, that wind example, like um, I may not have a wind T test or something like that, um, but what I can do is I can go into simulation and build a simulated model of how the wind works and look and then run that simulation for 10,000 times and then look at all of the sounds that were generated by my wind model. And that will give me a distribution of sounds. And then from there, I take the data from the real world, I compare it to the distribution that came out of my sim, and that's how I can define a p-value. So sometimes you build hypothesis tests yourself and often you use simulations to generate the distribution of whatever your statistic is. So sometimes we have off-the-shelf tests like uh, t-tests. Other times we actually build hypotheses ourselves and we often use simulation to do that. All right, so the other thing we don't talk about in a lot of classes that much up until now, um, we might define it, but I don't feel like we really get into it that much, but we really do care about it in this class is beta, the type two error, which is given that um, it is a ghost, how often do we say that it's normal? So that's what we mean by H0 is false. It's not the wind. Given that it is something other than the wind, it's a burglar, um, it's a dog, it's a rat. Um, you know, uh, how often, so given that it is not just the wind, how often are we going to end up claiming that it is the wind with our test, whatever test we chose to use? And so that's our type two error or false negative rate. Um, it just becomes more convenient for us to talk instead of a false negative rate for the flip side of that as the true positive rate, which is just, again, given that it is not the wind, given that it is something else, a dog, a branch, a ghost, whatever, then what's the probability that we actually say it is not the wind? So we properly say it's not the wind. And that is a term we call statistical power. It's also called sensitivity or the true positive rate, TPR. And so the power we get comes in part 
from the mathematical formulation of the test, but also, um, and perhaps more importantly, comes from the variability. So what that distribution of sounds naturally is and the number of samples. So how often we've actually heard that funny, you know, that funny sound. Um, and so if we only get one shot at it, then, um, then we probably don't have very much statistical power. We probably can't say much at all. But if we get a lot of shots at it and consistently, you know, whenever, um, you know, whenever you go into a particular room, you hear a moan. Um, and when you step out of the room, the moan stops. Um, if every time you go into the room, you hear that moan, the one time you heard it, if, if it was only one time and you heard it and you never heard it again, if you went into that room, then it might be some weird door creak or whatever. You heard something down the street that just happened to, you know, get in. But, but now that you have a lot more, um, you know, more samples, then you know that that particular outcome is probably not very likely. And so the more samples you get, the more certainty you can get about whether, um, you know, about your statistical power, the more you can increase the probability that you will properly reject the normal when the normal isn't the case. So those two things there. So we're, we're gonna talk a lot about power analyses, which tell us how many samples we need or what deviation from the normal we can detect given the amount of samples we have in our budget. So um, there about terminology, I was saying that we're gonna try to, as much as possible, use the terminology that a positive, is a detection of a deviation from normal, a deviation from the null. So that's what we say is a positive result. Now, your stakeholders might use a different language when you talk to them about these things. And that, um, and so we have to be kind of cognizant about that because um, the positive to us, you know, this, this terminology might make sense because it's good for us to detect when things aren't normal as you know, quality control people or whatever, you really want to detect that there's a problem with your system, that this isn't just uh, an, a data point you could have gotten from the normal system. But sometimes people use the different phrasing where they use positive to be not rejecting the null because rejection, rejecting of the null sounds like a negative result. So this is something that often gets confused, especially when people starting and then way out there when you're dealing with your stakeholders, it happens all the time. So I do not recommend using the terms true positive rate, true negative rate, all that with stakeholders who, because they probably have a different impression or you just don't know what they think is a positive result. This is part of the reason why the term type one error and type two error, it sounds kind of crappy. Like it's like, oh, that doesn't really describe much, but nobody gets confused. I mean, you might get confused which one's which, but you, know, you just got to sort that out in your head. Nobody makes a philosophical assertion of what is type one error, but people do make an assertion of what is positive and what is negative. So it's, this is more subjective, whether you use positive or negative. So just be careful when you're talking about positive or negative results, because the terms that everyone else uses are not necessarily the terms that we use here. Um, and that's okay. We just need to be clear when we're communicating with people. But in this class, when I use the word positive, I mean detecting a difference from the null. That is a positive result. So rejecting the null, it sounds negative, but that's positive. It's good, I guess, to reject the null because you've detected something interesting as opposed to just what would happen under the normal everyday circumstances. It's good to know when there's a ghost in your house because like, that's really kind of interesting. It doesn't really matter if the wind happened to cause a branch to hit your roof. That's not that interesting. All right, so any questions about these notions, positive and negative? It's pretty clear. Maybe you guys already had this all sorted out before you came into here. Just wanna make sure we're all on the same page. And nothing online either. All right, so that brings us to this graphic, um, which is a really um, important conceptualization of where the trade-offs between these two things come from. And so I mentioned last time, we have this thing called the receiver operating characteristic curve, the ROC curve. And, um, and this one plots of any hyp hypothesis test, uh, the type one error on the x-axis and the statistical power or the true positive rate. So tr uh, false positive rate, 
on the horizontal axis, true positive rate on the vertical axis. And this green dashed or green dash dotted line in the diagonal is what you would get if you made your decision entirely by chance using a weighted coin. So if your coin always came up tails, um, always came up, uh, let's say, um, if we call this a true positive, let's say it always comes up negative, it always comes up null. So it's always gonna say, not, do not reject, do not reject. If it always comes up, do not reject, then you will never make a type one error, um, but you will always make a, a, a type two error. So you're always going to, you're gonna have no statistical power. So your true positive rate will be zero because you'll never be detecting positives, but at least your false positive rate will also be zero. If you flip that coin and 50% of the time it comes up heads and the other 50% it comes up tails, then by chance alone, 50% of the time, you will have a false positive rate of, uh, so you'll, you'll, have, you'll get, get it right 50% of the time. So you'll have a 50% um, type one error and a 50% statistical power or 50% type two error because you're saying that um, you know, half the time you detect and half the time you don't. And then if it always comes up, if it's a weighted coin where it always comes up heads, it always comes up detecting, a, a deviation from the null. So it's always a positive. Then 100% of the time you're detecting a positive. So that means you've got 100% type one error because when you shouldn't be detecting a positive, you always detect it. But you also have 100% statistical power, which means that you, when you should be detecting a positive, you will be detecting a positive. So the diagonal line on the ROC curve, that is the worst case scenario. If somebody just flipped a coin and they set the weight to the desired alpha. So that way you've guaranteed your alpha because that's what we market in a hypothesis test, the alpha. So a coin is by diagonal line. So our goal when we develop hypothesis tests, be they t-tests or whatever test you come up with on your own, um, is to lift off of that line up um, to this like magenta colored line up here. And you set your alpha, by you know, just choose where you wanna be on this line here. And then based on the number of samples, the variability in the test, that's what determines where you are in the vertical axis. So if you try a test with different alphas, you can fill out this line. Now I might say, where does this trade-off come from? This trade-off comes from this graph, which hopefully is familiar from 380 or 385 or other classes, where if we think about, um, for a, uh, if we assume that all of our data are normally distributed, but we just don't know the mean of that normal distribution, and that's what we're trying to figure out, then we have, um, if we assume that the mean is a particular thing that is the center of this distribution, then we know that we're going to get outcomes that will um, be to the left or to the right of this blue distri distribution, but they're not going to be very far to the right or very far to the left. So this TN here, true negative, that's the distribution of outcomes we would expect under the null hypothesis. Now, um, if we did have a deviation from the null that, um, so if we're, again, we're trying to estimate the mean of this distribution. If the real mean was over here, we got the same shaped distribution, but it's been shifted over. And, um, and so this one will produce more results on the, the right-hand side of the graph, less on the left, but there's gonna be significant overlap. And so this overlap is what generates all of the stuff that goes on here. So if I get a particular um, data point, so I, I sample and I say, uh, this outcome, could this outcome come, could have come from the blue distribution or the red distribution? Well, there's a lot of outcomes that could come from each, and there's a bunch of outcomes that could come from both. And that right there, um, that's the, so there are outcomes that could have come from the red distribution in this little FN circle that if, that we might decide because they are so far into the blue that probably came from the blue circle or the blue distribution. And so those are what we refer to as our false negatives. And, um, and then likewise, there's gonna be outcomes that are in our blue distribution, or there'll be outcomes in the red distribution, um, sorry, there are outcomes in the blue distribution that are so far out of the blue distribution that we might decide that they're from the red distribution. And so we'll call them positive results, detections of deviation from the normal, and, um, and, we'll, and those will be false positives. And so 
this graph right here, which captures all of the things that would happen under your hypothesis and a set of things that would happen if your hypothesis was not true, um, ends up kind of setting up this so-called confusion matrix, which is um, for 100% of your tests, how is that 100% divided up in terms of how many times you got it right and how many times you got it wrong? The false positive rate, the true positive rate, the true negative rate, the false negative rate. And if we set our alpha value, that's this kind of threshold that we're putting here. And our alpha value is basically saying, um, if you get results to the right of this vertical line, we're going to call those from the red distribution. We're gonna call those rather, I should say more precisely, we're gonna call those not from the blue distribution. So if they fall to the right of that line, it's not blue. It might actually be blue, but we're just gonna decide. That's our hypothesis test, it's not blue. If they fall to the left of that line, we're gonna say it is blue. Even if they might actually be from red, we don't know. But if they fall to the left of that line, we're gonna say it is blue. And so you can see that sliding this vertical line one way or another is exactly choosing an alpha value. So if I slide this red line far over this way, then um, I am changing my alpha value so that um, I am looking for, um, I want to make less and less error, less and less false positive error. So sliding the line this way is like making the alpha value lower. Sliding the line this way means that I'm accepting more and more false positives, but I'm reducing my false negatives. So sliding the line this way ends up making my alpha value higher, but it's making my beta lower. So this graph right here, which I'll end up showing over and over again, this is what sets up the fundamental trade-off between type one error and type two error. It is impossible to have no error in both. In order to get less error in one, you're taking on more error in the other. And that is the reason why the ROC curve always looks like one of these. It always looks like this, where as I'm increasing my type one error, I'm increasing my statistical power and vice versa. So that's kind of the picture that I want you to, to have here. Any questions on this general overview here? And this applies not just for parametric statistical tests like the t-test applies for any hypothesis test. There's gonna be a distribution under the null and there'll be um, for every alternative hypothesis, there'll be their own distribution. Um, that becomes the difficulty in calculating the statistical power because um, for a t-test, it's easy to calculate statistical power relatively because we assume so much about the alternative hypotheses. All alternative hypotheses under the t-test are still normally distributed and still have the same variance as our null. We assume that going into the t-test. We'll talk about that here in a second. But for general tests, non-parametric tests, where you can't assume anything about the alternative hypotheses, it becomes very difficult to calculate statistical power. And so you kind of have to do it in the field with ground truth data. So you kind of have to run simulations in your situation where you know that an alternative is true and then see what happens. Um, but, but this general idea is always there, even if you don't quite know how to calculate this red thing. So is this clear so far, at least starting to become less murky? Okay. All right, so let's start zooming in on a statistical test you'll use a lot. Every time you use a confidence interval, you use this statistical test. And, um, and so we'll talk about that next week when we start getting into interval estimates. And so um, this is uh, the student's t-test. So this was developed by a guy named uh, William Seeley Gossett. Um, back in uh, the start of uh, the 20th century in 1908. And, um, and Gossett worked at Guinness Brewing. He was a, effectively an industrial engineer um, working at, at Guinness. And at that time, if you wanted to do statistics, large sample statistics were all you could do. So the agriculture people, those are the people doing the statistics. And uh, so statistics really kind of started with biology and, and a term that we still use actually in this university, biometry. So kind of the, what statistics came out of, uh, modern statistics came out of the field of biometry, which was like measures for measuring biology or measuring 
uh, biological data and making inferences about it. And in fact, it, you don't take statistics in the School of Life Sciences, you take biometry, but all it is is statistics. And, um, and so at that time, um, the, state, the, the state of the art in biometry was these agricultural studies where you had giant fields of corn. And so you had maybe one type of corn or corn with one preparation and corn with another type of preparation. And you had so many samples, so many ears of corn that you could just take an average. And as long as the average growth rate was higher in one field than another, you could say, whatever I did to that field is probably better than what I did to this field. Now, a Gossett, a Guinness was saying, we would like to do the same thing with beer. So we would like to say, we've got one uh, process we've got for, the, the, for, our, um, for our Guinness, for our beer, and another here. And we don't know if it's changing the taste. And so maybe we wanna go out and do a taste test. And, but it would be really nice if we didn't have to get a thousand people tasting the beer and another thousand people tasting the beer in order for us to make um, a comparison there. So Gossett, um, uh, when it actually went to the sort of one of the leading statisticians, bio, bio, biometricians at the time, who was doing all this large sample stuff and said, do you think there's a way we could develop a small sample statistics where maybe in only 10 samples, we could conclude that, uh, that this group was probably different than this other group. And, um, and actually the, the, the one who, uh, who we worked with, Pearson, um, was not a fan of the idea, but he uh, kind of admired the spunk or whatever of Gossett and helped him with it. And Gossett came up with what we know as the T-test. Now, um, when Gossett got back to Guinness and showed him that it worked, um, he said, but you know, I, I think this really could revolutionize a lot of industries. Wouldn't it be great if we could publish this? And Guinness said, well, formally, you can't publish anything you develop here. It's an intellectual property issue. Um, but we would look the other way if someone under a different name happened to publish this exact same thing. And so Gossett published the t-test under the name student. And that's the reason we have the student's t-test. So a lot of times we hear student's t-test, we think, oh, this is like a fake statistic just generated to, to teach um, students things and then they'll forget about it later. Like AP calculus classes in high school, right? They just teach, or AP computer science classes in high school. They just teach kind of from a fictitious programming language because I don't know why they do it, but they do that. And then they go off to college and they have to forget everything they learned in high school because that's just how it works. So, but that's not what was going on here in the student's t-test. He actually just chose a name and he said, I'm gonna choose student as my name. And so that's why we have the student's t-test. It is used it's an extremely important statistic. And so let's take a look at the student's t-test. And it later got generalized. So um, for example, um, the ANOVA. The ANOVA is kind of a generalization of the t-test to more than one group or more than two groups. And, um, and uh, Fisher um, was the one who sort of worked with Gossett to kind of come up with the ANOVA. And, um, and Gossett was a very humble person. He actually said, you know, um, if I hadn't come up with the t-test, Fisher eventually would have. And so he just, you know, that's another reason why I think he was okay with just publishing it under student. And then later on, we could figure out, well, who the heck was student? And then we turned up with Gossett. So, um, so how does the t-test work? So the idea here is that you've gone out, you've taken data, um, you have a hypothesis that you're testing, and that hypothesis is that the mean is equal to some uh, number. So this is like, given our current um, processes at the factory, we know that this is gonna be the mean satisfaction of the beer. And we then go and we do taste tests um, and we end up taking a bunch of different people and we have them taste our beer in the new process and we see how well does it do. And we're gonna take all of their um, answers and we're gonna average them together. Now we're assuming that their answers are normally distributed we average them up together, and that's the one sample in the one sample t-test. There's an average of these um, samples that we've taken out there. So it's a little deceiving where it says one sample. We're actually taking a bunch of samples, but we're averaging them together, and then that average is the one sample. The idea here is that if I talk to 10 people, I will get one average. If I then talk to another 10 people, even if they're all drawn from the same distribution, I will just, by statistical chance, get a different number here. So the reason we say this is one sample is that the sample statistic averaging 10 people, that sample mean has variance. And so this is one sample from 
the distribution, the sampling distribution of the sample mean. And so, um, so that's where we get this term one sample. So given that uh, we know that one sample, we subtract off how far it is away from our hypothetical mean. We normalize by this weird thing and we'll see where this comes from, this S over square root of N, and that gives us a sampling statistic. And under the assumptions that the data we collected were independent and drawn from a normal distribution, which under the null, but had this hypothetical mean, then um, this statistic here will have a student's T distribution. And that student's T distribution will be the thing that we use to define our p-value that we can then use to reject or accept based on whatever alpha we choose. So we have to check for independence and normality before you do a t-test. And so this is something that I'm not gonna force you to do in this class, but if you ever wanna use a t-test out there, before you do that, before you go into jump and say, do the t-test, jump is not gonna do this for you. You have to run a test for independence. And usually that's just, you, you design the experiment so the samples are definitely independent. They so don't have to test for that, but you do have to do a test for normality. That's where that Shapiro-Wilkes test comes into play. And so you go into jump or whatever, and you run your Shapiro-Wilkes. And if your data are normally distributed, you can move forward and do a t-test. If they're not, there's a bunch of other steps that you might have to do. All right, so, um, so where does all this come from? So again, we're gonna assume that the data are independent from each other. We're gonna assume that they're normally distributed with a certain mean and a certain variance and that the same mean and variance for all the samples. And so if it, under those assumptions, we can do a little bit of math. So we're gonna define our sample here. So it's gonna average our data points and we can then rewrite that as this sum over here where each data point is normalized by the number of total data points. Under the null hypothesis, that's our assumption, then, um, then we do know that the expected value of every one of these um, samples is the, the null mean. And so the expected value of this average is going to be n times that mean divided by n. So it should also be, um, be the, the, this mean here. So we call this an unbiased estimator of the mean. Um, and then so if we subtract off the mean, which is just a constant, the expected value of what is the numerator in the t-test should be equal to zero under the null, if it really did come from the null, from the null hypothesis. So then the variance, where does the variance come from? Well, um, so the variance, on this thing here. Well, the variance on um, each individual summoned here that goes into the sum is just going to be the standard deviation divided by n squared. So this just comes from probability theory. The ver when you divide something by a, a constant, the variance of that thing is gonna be its variance divided by that constant squared. So that's what we get here. So sigma squared over n squared. Now, um, so the, if I look at the, um, so that's for the, this Y bar here. Um, the one I'm trying to say here is that, uh, right. So the, so the variance, so if I subtract off um, a constant, it doesn't change the variance. So the variance of Y bar minus mu is just the variance of Y bar. Now the variance of Y bar, again, probability theory here, um, is just n times the variance of each one of these things. Now I just calculated the variance of each one of these things was sigma squared over n squared. Well, n times that is gonna be sigma squared over n. So the variance of y bar is sigma squared over n. So what's the standard deviation of y bar? What's the square root of that, which is the standard deviation of the original distribution divided by square root of n. This is where that funny term in the denominator of the t-test comes from. It is the standard deviation of the sample mean, of the sampling distribution. So we have the real distribution of responses, and then we have the, the distribution of averages from our experiment when we ask 10 people what they think. And that standard deviation will be the standard deviation of the original distribution divided by square root of n. Okay, so 
So that is what we refer to as the standard error of the mean or the SEM. So when you hear people say standard error, they usually um, are abbreviating standard error of the mean. So when you hear me say standard deviation, I'm talking about the population. When you hear me see standard error, or I'll try to always say standard error of the mean, I'm talking about the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So what is the spread in mean estimates? And that's what we have here. The more samples you get, the tighter this gets. So if you sample from a thousand people, then your averages are gonna probably much be really close to the population. If you sample from 10 people, then every different 10 people you sample from, you get a different one. All right, any questions about this so far, this idea of the standard error of the mean? It just comes from the assumption of what is, or it comes from deriving, what is the standard deviation of this formula, given that each one of these y's is normally distributed with a known mean and standard deviation? Let's see, any questions online? Question online, what is yj? yj, that is the jth sample from the distribution. So if I imagine that I've got a population of a million people or 10 million people that could possibly drink Guinness beer, then I'm gonna go out and sample from 10 of those. And Y1, that'll be the first person. What did you think of the beer? And they give me a score. Y2, what did you think of the beer? And they give me a score. And that all the way goes up to Y10. Uh, so each one of these, y, uh, YI through YJ, or YI uh, through YJ all the way up to YN, each Y with a subscript is a sample from the population. So Y hat is the average value of all the samples that I've taken. So down here, when I say Y I, Y J, this is my shorthand of saying that uh, across all individuals, I'm assuming that the, um, the variance is the same from one individual to another. So, um, so I'm just saying, I don't have a different distribution that all of the individuals come from the same distribution. So they all have the same variance. Okay. All right, so what can we do with that? Well, um, I'm, so uh, we now know under the null, the expected value of the numerator of the t-test is zero. And we know then that the variance of the numerator of the t-test that standard deviation of the numerator of the t-test is this uh, sigma, uh, the standard deviation of the population divided by square root of n. So um, by the central limit theorem, this is a sum here, right? So by the central limit theorem, this y hat becomes, is, becomes more and more normal as you take more and more samples. And so the distribution of y hat becomes more like a normal where its mean is mu and its standard deviation is sigma over square root of n for a large number of samples. And if I subtract off that mean, then it becomes a normal distribution with a mean of zero with this standard deviation for large numbers of samples. Now, if I standardize the score by not only subtracting off the mean, but dividing by the standard deviation, this is where you get the t-statistic. It's just a z-score. The t-statistic is a z-score of the sampling distribution or of the sample average here. So it's a z-score of this thing where it's this value here minus its mean, its mean under the null, divided by the standard deviation of y hat under the null. And so this thing right here is a standard normal if n is very, very large. And so that's the motivation behind the t statistic is we're just gonna take a z score, which wouldn't be normally what you would do, so to speak, normally would be what you would do if you were using a large number of samples like they did before the t test. But what Gossett wanted to know is what's this distribution for small n if I do small numbers of samples? And um, I'm not going to go through the derivation of that, but he did. And, um, and they figured out that so this is what it would look like. So this is my standard normal, the blue one. And the red one is the distribution of that z-score if you only have um, one degree of freedom, which is two samples. So under, um, under one degree of freedom, 
this is what that would look like. So under the null, where it is a normal distribution with a known mean and known standard deviation, then if you only have two samples, the sample that you get out of that, if you standardize it, will be this thing, which does not look like a, a standard normal, but that's okay because we know what it looks like because Goss figured that out. And so we can now use this to determine if we are far from the normal, far from the, um, the null expectation, or if we are right in line with data that would have come up with the null. If I go from two samples of the population to three samples of the population, now I have two degrees of freedom. And I see that the, um, so that this green one or this red one here is gonna become green. It, this gets shifted up as I go to, uh, as I add more data. As I add even more data, it gets shifted up higher and higher and higher. And basically as we're seeing here is that as you get more and more samples, the T distribution becomes the standard normal. In other words, you basically can just use a Z test. So for high numbers of samples, use a Z test like they did in the 1800s. For low numbers of samples, what Gossett gave us is a distribution that allows us to use something analogous to a Z test or a Z score, but we can now use it when you have less than 30 samples. So that's what a T test is. So we call this um, distribution a pivotal quantity. It only depends on the degrees of freedom. And this is just sort of summer is saying the same thing that I was just saying here is that you can view um, the T statistic as a kind of normalized distance between two alternative hypotheses. And so the more samples you get, the bigger difference the, that will be between these two hypotheses, the less samples, the more ambiguity you get. And so sampling more just pushes the alternative hypothesis farther and farther away from the null. And that's kind of the geometric version of what's going on here. And so, um, so yeah, so that's the t-test. So any questions about that, about where the t-test comes from and what that quantity means? It's just a z-score of the sample of the sampling distribution, really. All right, so we take that T distribution and we can plug it into this um, uh, diagram here. And so now instead of having standard normals, you've got T distributions, but it's the same analysis. So you've got a T distribution under the null and you've got T distributions under alternative means that they might be. So we still have to assume they have the same, same variance, but under different alternatives, then, um, then you can imagine this, uh, this other T distribution uh, may be shifting far away, maybe being very close. And as you gather more data, then this alternative distribution will end up moving farther and farther away, making it easier to discriminate, thus moving this magenta line in the ROC curve up higher and higher and higher for the same alpha. So that's what we're kind of doing visually. All right, so, um, so with that, Let's lighten that a little bit. So this is an example. So again, in the spirit of Halloween, um, this is a particular outfit that Neil Gilbert, who was a grad student, I think when he took this, um, uh, 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 was wearing. So he's got a t-shirt here and it's got this on it. So what's the joke? And if I go back just to, to freshen our minds, um, let, let's look at, this is the T distribution. This is the normal distribution. Notice the T distribution has fatter tails. So if I go back and I look at, um, at this here, to, can somebody tell me what's the pun? Any thoughts? What type of shirt is it? What's on the shirt? He's a grad student. He's wearing the shirt. Anybody? just beneath you, this level of humor. All right, well, maybe I'll go. So we add to it, he's holding a Guinness and he's also got a box of tea. Anything there? And I'd also say not a normal student. So the joke here is that this is a student's T-shirt, a T-shirt. I got nothing, crickets. 
crickets. Okay. Um, so um, I got an LMAO online. So that's good. Uh, so yeah, I got it. He's a, uh, he's a T student. So almost got a little flip there, but yeah, so the student's T shirt. So, you know, Halloween is coming up. This is still available. I think it's just electrical tape on a shirt. So you guys can go out and take this. It uh, should be nice weather this weekend. Um, so, um, so go ahead and give this a shot. But yeah, so, um, so I was, you know, my kind of joke is he's not a normal student either. So that would be the other way you could pun on this. And then that is not a normal distribution. So he's very deliberate about being fat tailed. So it's stumpy in the middle and fat on the end here. That is a T distribution, not a normal distribution. So that's kind of the joke there. All right, so, um, so yeah, so this is what you do when you know that your data are normally distributed. And, um, and, and have independence. Now, the question is what happens when normality does not hold? Um, now, um, if you assume normality, you get more statistical power because there's just a lot more you can know about the data. But if you do one of those tests like Shapiro will, can you find out your data are not normally distributed? You cannot use a t-test. Um, you can do some things like you can actually uh, transform the data. So you can apply different mathematical formulas to the data that stretch and scale it to make it normal. And then you can apply the t-test to that. Or you can use what's called a, a non-parametric test. And these have less power, but you can use them on more data. So the, um, after the t-test came along, another uh, group of people came together and well, actually they, they discovered it kind of independently. They came up with, the Man Whitney U test. And so it's called a U test because the U is kind of like comes after T. And a U test is just a non parametric um, T test. And there's non parametric versions of paired T tests, there are non parametric versions of ANOVAs. And so basically, all of the tests you've probably learned so far T test, paired T test, ANOVA all depend upon normality. If you don't have normality, Go to Google and say non-parametric t-test, and the first link will be a u-test. Say non-parametric ANOVA. The first test will be a Kruskal-Wallis test. And they, you apply them identically the way you would. You just give up statistical power. And so that's the one downside. So it's better to apply a parametric test, even if you have to transform your data. But if no transformation can make your data normal, you can go to a non-parametric, and uh, you just lose power. And so that's the way you would handle that. All right, um, so let's just see an example that looks just like your homework here where we make use of that t-test, um, but um, we're gonna use a paired example instead. And so um, in, the, the la in the example from the last lecture, which is a little bit less like your homework, we said we gathered data from the real world, we gathered data from a simulation, and we wanna see um, does our simulation match the real world? And we, um, and so we used a, a t-test to do that. So we basically calculated an average from the real world that became our hypothet hypothetical mean. And then we gathered samples from our simulation. And then we said, um, do these samples from the simulation match up? And initially they didn't. So the t-test rejected the hypothesis that our sim matched the real world. So the hypothesis that they were the same from the same distribution was rejected. We looked back at our SIM, we changed the SIM to fix it so that we could say, oh, we forgot a particular component. We looked at that data and the t-test failed to reject. Now at that point, we can't accept the SIM as a good match for reality until we do a power analysis. So we did a power analysis and we said that with, um, I don't know, with so many samples, so I forget, I think we used six samples and we could look up What's the statistical power? And usually we say, as long as you have 80% statistical power, then it's, you're willing to accept um, a null hypothesis. You're willing to say, okay, let's just assume it's a null. We're probably, we might be wrong, but 80% is good enough. So um, this is an alternative way to do that. Instead of taking independent data from the real world and then bundling it into a, a single number that becomes your null hypothesis, what we're gonna do is actually look at the input data for the real world and feed the input data in instead of random numbers to our SIM, we can do that. So instead of randomly generating fake customers in our SIM, we're gonna take data from real customers and run it into our SIM and see what comes out of our SIM. 
So that's what we're going to do here. Now, that's going to mean that for every, like we're going to take Monday's data in the real world, we're going to simulate a Monday. We're going to take Tuesday's data from the real world. We're going to simulate a Tuesday and so on and so forth. Now, the Monday data point we get for the real world and the Monday data point we get from the sim are not independent of each other because they use the same customers. So we cannot use a, a, a standard uh, uh, t-test. We cannot use a two sample t-test as we might normally use where we've got one sample from one and the other from the other. We are gonna have to do some pairing. So, um, so instead what we do is we pair up each day and we say, what's the difference from real Monday to simulated Monday? And we use that difference and we say, is that difference significantly different from zero? What's the difference between Tuesday in the real and Tuesday in the sim? Is that difference, uh, you know, we assume that the null hypothesis of that difference is zero, is the data we get significantly different from zero? And we do all of those. So the differences become, become our samples. So this will be our hypothesis. The expected value of real minus simulated is equal to zero. That hypothesis is equivalent to saying the expected value of the real is equal to the expected value of the, sim, uh, of the simulated. And um, the power analysis for this test is easy um, to conduct, which is why I have you do it on the homework. And the power analysis, you actually get more statistical power with a paired test. So let's see how that looks. We have our input data set. This is like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever. Um, and so we assume that we're just modeling weekdays. We assume there's no difference between a Monday and a Tuesday or whatever. And that's why we're just saying, this is my data for Monday and so on. Data from Monday, what was the, um, the system output? So this, what's the average delay for customers on that Monday in the real world and in the simulation? On Tuesday in the real world versus the simulation. For each one of those, we can say, so on Monday, there was a, for the exact same customer stream, there was a difference in performance of 0.5 or whatever it is, of 0.8 on Tuesday, of negative 0.4 on Wednesday and so on. So we have all those differences. Then um, just for convenience, I can square those differences, um, a square deviation from mean, and that's gonna allow me to very easily calculate the um, mean and standard deviation of the differences. So that's why I've got to set these kind of tables up here. All right, so, um, so what do I do? I calculate the mean of this column, the mean difference, and then I calculate the standard deviation using this column, use making sure I divide by k minus one instead of k. And now that I've got the, I'm sorry, the variance. So now that I've got the, the mean and the variance, I'm going to use a one sample test. So and I'm sorry if I didn't explain this a little bit better, but a two sample t test is where you've got a, a hat on both sides of the numerator where it's x hat minus y hat. And a one sample test is where you've got um, the only one hat and then a number that you assume is, is true. And in this case, we're assuming that our null hypothesis is gonna be zero. So we've got the hat from this column, the average of this column minus zero divided by the expected um, standard deviation of the estimator of the D hat estimator. And that's, that's up there. So that's just the T statistic down there. So I get this thing down here, that'll end up being my t-statistic for this test. So when we talk about a paired t-test, like if you go into jump and I say, I wanna do a paired t-test and jump, and you, you will give it this column and this column and say, do a paired t-test. What jump does is it calculates this difference and it does a, a normal t-test against the null hypothesis of zero. That's all a paired t-test is is a two sample t-test would actually do a two sample t-test on this sample versus this sample. This average versus this average would plug that in. A one sample t-test um, on zero is equivalent to the paired t-test. So you can either do a paired t-test or if you calculated this column in jump or whatever program you're using, you could do a normal t-test against zero for this column and that's identical to a paired t-test. So that's what we're doing down here. If we do that, um, then, then the question is, how many samples, how many rows do we need to, um, to be able to achieve a desired statistical power? And so our desired power is 80%. Um, what someone has told us, our boss has told us, is that 
if the simulation output is within some capital D distance of the real system, I'm willing to accept your simulation as a surrogate for the real system. So all I need to do is prove to him or her that the simulated system, if it were outside of this range, I would have detected. And that's what the statistical power is. So this capital D, this is our kind of, um, you can think of it as a, a maximum distance away from the null that you're okay with not detecting. So if it's this far away or less, we're just going to call it equivalent to the null. That's what that is here. So I take that and I divide it by my standard deviation from uh, of these data. So what is the standard deviation in these data? So this is, does not have the divided by square root of n in it. And that gives me an effect size. And from that effect size, I go to my operation uh, operating characteristic curves in the back of the book. And I look at the operating characteristic curve for an alpha that I desire, 0.05. Zoom in on here, and I've got, for all of the effect sizes on the horizontal axis, I've got all of the type two errors on the vertical axis. And so statistical power is one minus type two error. So if I'm looking for an 80% statistical power, I'm looking for a 20% type two error. So I can just say for the effect size given, so let's say it was one. If the effect size was one, I go up here and I hit a type two error of 20% that lands on the 10 samples line. And that tells me that if I have 10 samples or more, I'm guaranteed to have a type two error of 20% or less. And that's how this operating characteristic curve works. And so, so that's, what we're, that's what we've done there. So um, it's the operating characteristic curves for a t-test, for a one sample t-test are very easy to find. They're easy to calculate, um, they're there. And, um, and so and you can look them up easier. For more complicated power analyses, there's actually whole software programs. There's a power program called G-Power that if you go off and you do stats in industry, you'll probably end up get buying a license to G-Power or whatever. And it's got a bunch of different tests in there and it'll be able to, to generate these curves for you for those tests. But a t-test is kind of simple enough. We just go to the back of the book and we can find it here. This, this is effectively a one sample t-test uh, statistical power, which is the same as a paired difference statistical power. So any questions about that? That basically is the process you go through on that second problem of the homework. You calculate this table with the differences, and then you test to see if the differences are statistically different from a null hypothesis of zero. And then you calculate the statistical power so that if you find that they're not that different from zero, then have I gathered enough samples that I can actually draw any conclusions? And if you have enough statistical power, then you can. You're supposed to do this before you run your experiment. And that's how you determine how many samples you need to take in the experiment. So in real life, you do a preliminary experiment to estimate variance, and then you calculate the effect size you need to detect practically. And then you use that to determine how many samples you need to actually go out and pay for. Then you pay for those samples, you run your experiment, and then you see that I reject or not. And if you don't, then you can accept so long as you've done the power analysis ahead of time. All right, any questions about that? That's basically the second part of the homework problem. And any questions online? Um, Okay, so just some comments about the uh, students' team stuff. Okay, all right. Um, so um, the rest of the stuff here, um, I do want to um, uh, just talk about it just briefly in the last couple of minutes we have here. So I tried to justify where the t-test comes from and all of its assumptions. The last thing I wanted to justify is where this five assumption comes from in, um, in chi-squared. And so the chi-squared is a funny formula. It doesn't look like it comes from anywhere. Um, and so what we, in order to understand the chi-squared, you have to think about what would the chi-squared look like if there were only two bins? So if you're flipping a coin and you're counting how many comes up heads or how many comes up tails, you could do a chi-squared for that to see if you had a fair coin or not. And, um, and then you'd have two bins and this is what the statistic would look like. Now, if you think about that, I don't need to use a chi-squared test for that. I can use a binomial test for that because 
really the if I know the um, the null hypothesis on my coin is a fair coin, then a binomial test tells me how many coin flips will come up in the heads bin and how many coins will come up in the tails. And so, um, but um, if you think about it, if you're counting up how and you know how many you know if I get a zero for tails, a one for heads, if I count up a bunch of those and add them all up together, that's just a sum. And so by the central limit theorem, if I add up enough heads and tails, eventually the binomial distribution, which is exact, will start looking like a normal distribution. And it turns out that happens when um, n times p, the number of coin flips times the probability, the expected, the, null, the hypothetical probability, when that is at least five, then this approximation holds. A binomial can be approximated by a normal under that case there. So the idea here is that if I've got NP sufficiently large, then I do kind of the same thing we did with the t-test, I generate a z-score. And so I say I've got a number of observed that landed in the bin minus a, um, an expected number that go in the bin divided by the standard deviation, which by this approximation, I know the formula for the standard deviation, all by the central limit theorem. And so if I then square that z-score, just why not? There, there we go. If I just square that z-score, um, then what I end up getting is this here, which you can do a partial fraction expansion of. And that partial fraction expansion gives you the formula that we use in the chi-squared. So it's just a partial fraction expansion of a squared version of a z-score forms the chi-squared for the case of two bins. So two bins has one degree of freedom because once you count up how many are in one bin, you know how many are in the other bin automatically. So this is the count for bin one, this is the count for bin two, but it all comes from a single z-score. So that's the one degree of freedom and two bins. So I don't want to um, go too much further here because we're kind of at the end here, but the idea is we can generalize that idea to k bins. And so this funny formula that we get for the chi-squared is not arbitrary at all. Each one of these come from a partial fraction expansion of a squared z-score. And that squared z-score is used under the approximation that a binomial is equal to a normal. And you can only make that approximation when n times p for every bin is greater than or equal to five. Under five, the central limit theorem hasn't really done enough of its magic and it's still really you need a binomial test for. Over five, you can start using a normal. And so once you can start using a normal, there's all sorts of other tools you can use. And that assumption that each one of those bins could be described by a standard normal allowed them to generate the chi-squared distribution which looks like this. And so um, each one, the degrees of freedom in a chi-squared distribution basically are the number of standard um, normals, the number of z-scores that they're using to do that math. And, um, and so um, not surprisingly, um, the, as you get um, a higher number here, this chi-squared, the chi-squared is describing you the sum of k minus one squared standard normals. So because this itself is a sum, it's subject to the central limit theorem. And so as the degree of freedom of a chi-squared gets higher, it gets more hump-shaped, and eventually this approaches a normal. So basically, as large sample sizes get large, you just use normal distributions and z-tests. And that's what they did in the 1800s. And in the 1900s, people started saying, this is crazy, we can't sample this much. And that's where we got things like the chi-squared test and the t-test. So it's all about small sample size. All right, so that's uh, all I've got for you. So I don't want to keep you any longer. So let's do, um, let's jump to an attendance exercise here and uh, get you out of here. And I hope you have a nice weekend. So the question here is what was the punchline to Neil Gilbert's shirt joke? So what was, what was the pun that he was trying to make? And thanks for bearing with me being a couple minutes late today and keeping you for two minutes late as well.
And if you have any other questions, feel free to talk to me at the class or um, come up uh, or email me or whatever. And um, otherwise, we'll see you next week. All right, uh, let me uh, just close up shop here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.